Any sufficiently advanced technology is indistinguishable from magic. Welcome, everybody, to this special episode of the Into the Impossible podcast. I'm your fearful host, Professor Brian Keating at University of California, San Diego's Arthur C. Clarke Center for Human Imagination. And today we have a very special guest, New York University Professor Charles Seif, joining us all the way from the East Coast somewhere, although it's hard to tell out the window. The, the view isn't quite as good as it is here in San Diego. But Charles, how are you? Where are you joining us from today? I'm great. I'm in the suburbs of New York right now. Uh, my house is under renovation, so I'm in. I'm actually in my mother's attic. <laughs> believe it or not. Well, it's uh, you know, it's it's just a return to normalcy in, in these wonderful pandemic podcasting times. Uh, I want to I want to thank you first of all for coming on the show, and second of all for doing a service to uh, to physicists in particular. We're going to go deep. We're going to nerd out, uh, and that is to discuss your wonderful new book, Hawking Hawking which comes on the heels of very many scientific journeys in uh, so-called popular writing. Uh, this one is, is from Basic Books, a, a fine imprint. And, uh, and I've devoured the book. I have it in all, well, at least two different forms, but I have two copies of the hard copy. Uh, one copy of the Kindle and uh, soon to get the Audible book as well. It comes out next month in June. We'll probably time the podcast to come out around that time. I've loved all your uh, uh, writings and, and so far that I followed you. Let me ask you a question. You're a professor of journalism, correct? How does a journalist know so much about science that he or she can talk about uh, four-dimensional wick rotations and talk about uh, uh, Penrose diagrams uh, and the difference between a Penrose diagram for a black hole versus a Penrose diagram for a singularity in the big... How, how do you come to this level of, uh, of intellectual peripatetism? Well, uh, I, I had a strange path as a journalist. I actually trained as a mathematician. Um, when, uh, I was an undergraduate, I, I always thought I was going to be a PhD mathematician. I actually switched from physics to mathematics, uh, long story there. Um, but, uh, so I, I thought I was going to do pure math and I was studying, I went to graduate school. Um, I picked up an NSF, uh, grant for supercomputer time and I came up with a thesis that I could do. And I was realizing that, you know, with, with Moore's law, um, if I hold off for six years, it would just solve itself. So I was kind of depressed that, okay, so my entire corpus of work was just buying some time. And I happened to, at the time also to get a, a I, I liked writing. So I got a internship at The Economist to do science journalism. And I went over there for a few months and I said, forget this math thing, I, I, I found my calling. And so I spent my life writing about math and science, uh, physics in particular uh, was my you know, real passion for, uh, because as a journalist, kind of understanding, un I, I can't say I have a total understanding since I'm not embedded in the physics, but having that extra level of knowledge really gave me a leg up and I, I and it's an exciting time, as, as you yourself know, how how cool the stuff that we've learned in the past 20 years. Yeah, it's really a golden age, not only for, you know, scientific journalism, but for science itself, especially cosmology. And many of the topics and subjects you talk about in this book, which has a wonderful name called Hawking Hawking, the selling, the selling of a scientific celebrity, published April 6th by Basic Books, as I said. Um, and we have a lot of friends and, and contacts in, in common, and and uh, and I love the book. And I said I thank you because I had on a character who's in the book, uh, Leonard Malad now, uh, on this podcast about six months ago to discuss his book on Stephen Hawking, A Memoir of Friendship. And, uh, yeah, of course, you know, that's a delightful book, and, and he's, he's waxing rhapsodically about his late uh, great colleague and friend. But during that conversation, I revealed to him that I had heard Stephen Hawking speak in 1995 at a Royal Academy meeting. I happened to be in London, and I said, how often do I get a chance to hear Stephen Hawking? And so I line these streets like a rock concert that you describe in this book whenever he would speak. And this is kind of at the height of his fame just a few years after um, the book that looms large in your book, Hawking Hawking, is a brief history of time. We're going to spend a lot of time talking about that. But I remember going there and listening to the talk, and that was back when he could respond in what I call you know, quasi real time, where you could ask a question after a lecture, and it didn't have to be submitted ahead of time. A young 
person asked him a question, Professor Hawking, I have a question. Why did you write A Brief History of Time? It's rumored that uh, no one who has bought it has actually read it cover to cover and that nobody understands it. Why did you write this book? And he said very, and I'll never forget, he said, because my daughter needed to pay for boarding school. And I laughed. Everybody laughed. Um, but I remember talking to a Milad now and I said, if I was writing a book, this is before I knew about your book, uh, Charles, uh, I would be called Hawking Incorporated, but I actually prefer your title better. Uh, <laughs> but I realized he's a businessman, as Jay-Z would say, he's not just a businessman, he's a businessman. And, uh, and he had to have an industry, but I came away from that conversation a little bit more sympathetic to Steven because I learned he had to be turned over in the middle of the night, you know, for basically most of his life, his tracheostomy would clog, he would choke to death almost every day, or, you know, the danger loomed large. Um, so I want to ask you first, um, first of all, you rat, you uh, validated that story in the book. So it's not just my uh, senior moments, uh, you know, that he did actually say that explicitly on numerous occasions, as he would often do. And what's so wonderful about your scholarship, and this book is it's got 30 pages worth of footnotes, basically, and references, uh, it's a work of scholasticism that actually is very good, Charles, for physics majors. And I'm going to give this to physics majors. I've actually given it to one of my uh, primary students um, already because it's, it's actually a great um, a book for treating uh, subjects in black hole physics and gravitational physics and learning the history, as we often don't. I want to ask you, though, um, it must have taken a lot of courage to pitch a critical biography of basically a man who's been elevated to the status of saint. Um, not so much within physics, but within the billions of people worldwide who found him to be the most recognizable scientist. How challenging was it for you to write a criticism of a saint, uh, anti-hagiography, I guess you'd call it? And um, have you faced any blowback since that time? Yeah, uh, well, I, I think I went into this a little naively. Uh, <laughs> I mean, I, I, I knew um, that Hawking had this symbolism that was great. And I, I knew that um, trying to talk about the real person behind the symbolism was was not going to be popular in some circles. But um, I had spoken over the years to people within the cosmology community, within the um, uh, physics community, who would talk frankly about Hawking's place in their universe. And so I thought that it wouldn't be so hard to write this up in such a way where people, where people would frankly just talk about him and, and celebrate him as a person. Um, and it turned out to be a lot harder than that because you're, you're absolutely right that it, it, it is like uh, going and kicking the shins of Mother Teresa in some ways, uh, even though I, I mean, I, I tried very hard uh, not to make it a hatchet job, not to kind of wallow in the bad parts of this personality. I mean, all of us have parts of their personality that if, if you had a biographer go after you, you'd probably be embarrassed about. I mean, that's, that's human nature. Um, but at first I, I actually had a bit of difficulty selling it. Um, it took a while to kind of, uh, fewer publishers were interested than I expected. Mm -hmm. um, and it's actually the first book that I have done with basic, everything else I've done has been with Viking. Um, so there was that. And then, People I've spoken to over the years and have been very frank about kind of their work and Hawking's work and all that um, would just refuse to speak to me, even ones I've had very good relationships with in the past. And I think it's not just people who were close friends with him and want to preserve that image. But it's also his antagonists who really didn't want to look like they were getting into the slugging match, especially after the... Uh, uh, this this symbol, he, he died not so long yeah. ago. It was, it was it was tragic, and to speak badly of the mm -hmm. dead, even though again, I, I, I wasn't trying to elicit the, uh, the, the dirt. It was really just trying to get at who he was, and who he was is so much more interesting <laughs> than kind of a symbol. As, as I, I hope we all are. I mean, it's, we're, we're we're all more than characters. And of course, you know, his his uh, character was intimately connected to. Uh, to his disability, to his ALS uh, disease, and and in that sense, it's not only speaking about the dead. It's it's you know you risk all sorts of uh, of of pushback and blowback, perhaps because you're criticizing someone with profound disabilities who overcame them. 
despite this death sentence at an early age. But what I um, what I found so uh, so delightful about the book is that you don't you don't treat him with pity. And in fact, I think you treat him with respect. And to assess his legacy with respect is, I think, one of the highest honors one can afford. And I, I just want to salute you for doing that, for having the courage to write this book. And, um, you know, and I'm, and I'm sure there has been because there is basically this industry. And now that he's gone, you know, it's, it's ramped up even more. I mean, we did a special episode of the Into the Impossible podcast, which I'll put a link. I think it'll appear up here. Uh, the link to it uh, with uh, my colleague, Dr. Dr. Doctor. He's a real doctor and he's also a Ph.D. Eric Veery, who's the director of the Arthur C. Clarke Center for Human Imagination, he and Peter Diamandis, who was also a guest on the podcast and who appears in the book, um, uh, they were the flight surgeon, so to speak, for Stephen's zero gravity flight, uh, which you recount in the book. And we did an episode right after he passed away, and I've done multiple episodes, including with his uh, late friend, uh, his not, he's not late, thank God, Roger Penrose, who's become a good friend of the show. And, and we actually talked about whether or not, you know, Stephen would have uh, garnered a Nobel Prize uh, in recent uh, in the recent Nobel Prize that was offered this past uh, this past year. And of course, I've spoken out against the Nobel Prize as another form of hagiography. It does appear in your book many times. Uh, but uh, but I want to first turn to Stephen as a as a physicist, and then we can get into uh, Stephen as a as a writer, because actually. I'm a little bit more, uh, you know, now impressed by Stephen's book. First of all, it came out when you and I were in high school, basically. And that book, A Brief History of Time, really was an inspiration for many physicists to go into physics and to learn more about it. Um, but I do feel like there has been a fast one pulled over not only most of the scientific community who, you know, every 20 years you have to go back and rewrite all of scientific history, right? Um, but But also on the public. And that is that... Um, the main goal that Stephen had was twofold in his life, as I see it, at least with regard to theology. He wanted to invalidate or in, you know, vis inviscerate the need for a God, and he did so in two ways. One was that he claimed the two roles that God had would be to um, in, you know, initiate the universe and then instantiate physics. So you can think of you know, creating this, this sim city and then giving it rules and laws. And those are the two things. In A Brief History of Time, he claims he utterly devastates the need for, uh, for God to initiate the universe. And in A Grand Design, he uh, eviscerates the need to have a God to instantiate the laws of physics. Uh, where was he wrong in the, first, in the first instance of A Brief History of Time uh, you know, in, in, in invalidating the need for God to create time where is that argument off the rails from a physics perspective or math mathematician's perspective? Yeah. Um, well, I, again, I'll, I'll say that again, I'm a journalist and not a physicist. So uh, to. No, nobody's perfect, Charles. Nobody's perfect. <laughs> well, uh, one would say that uh, being a journalist is far more imperfect than other people. But um, so. Yeah, it's, I mean, the, 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 the taking down the no boundary um, hypothesis, uh, I, 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 let's, let's put it this way. I mean, I, when I was reporting on cosmology daily, um, I didn't really encounter very many people who took it seriously uh, in the sense that the, I mean, I never really got a sense of whether it was because the it required this whole different mechanism, uh, the mathematical formalism that people weren't comfortable with, which is a lot of the excuse that I got, or whether they really just didn't buy it as a whole. And uh, I never really formed an opinion external to that, but I just got the sense that it was not mainstream. And I guess that feeling kind of, uh, I, I picked up that feeling. In fact, actually, in, in reporting this book, I spoke to some people who are much more diehard about it um, than most others. And, and I mean, what they said to me is that, I mean, and even they really didn't buy the details because when you look at it, and Neil Turok told me, kind of the more you look at the fine parts of what the no boundary proposal was, there's less there <laughs> there that the... the the, it, 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 it kind of dissipates into a mist as you try to kind of uh, burrow down into the details. Yeah. Uh, 
But the people who admire it do say that it was really kind of a bold attempt to do exactly as you're, as you're saying, kind of, uh, but in, in more mathematical terms, it is to kind of have to sidestep the whole question of determining boundary conditions. Um, and the theological interpretation, of course, got uh, Hawking into trouble with uh, philosophers whom he was battling with all his life. Um, I still am a, 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 of the mindset that, I, I mean, I, I, it isn't mainstream. I, I don't think it really answers much. And later in his life, he kind of was using, because some of the most elegant elements of the no boundary assumptions, like all these universes had to be compact, um, blew up later on. And so as, and so he was relying more and more upon fixes and kludges and anthropism to fix it all. And it just seemed less and less elegant to me. So do I have the physics chop to say, no, this is garbage? I, I, I would not claim that, but it, it is less and less appealing over time, especially as the kind of initial simplicity um, dies uh, to fix it, uh, to fix the problems that he was finding. Especially, I mean, not least of which, the initial version kind of forced a big crunch um, <laughs> that because of the compactification, all the universes had to be compact. You had to have a closure, and uh, Turok showed that that wasn't true. But uh, that was a prediction, <laughs> and it, it failed. Uh, and so, I mean, I, I have a lot less confidence in, in things that get. Yeah, I mean the the most damning condemnation of the trick, which my my very astute audience will be familiar with is a property of uh, analytic, you know, calculus and analytic geometry called a wick rotation. Uh, and actually the most damning condemnation of it is Hawking's words himself. So I quote, in any, from a brief history of time, uh, in any case, as far as everyday quantum mechanics is concerned, we may regard our use of imaginary time and Euclidean space time as merely a mathematical device or trick to calculate answers about real space time. And, and you have such a delightful uh, approach to this. You, 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 you constantly remind the, the reader that, that he was calling this a trick. And, and then you, you further reinforce it by saying, calling it imaginary uh, space and imaginary, and imaginary time <laughs> rather than space time, which is what all physicists work in. So physicists abhor a trick as much as uh, nature abhors a vacuum, uh, about which Hawking also had much to say. <laughs> I might, I might dispute that actually, and in fact, this 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 uh, goes partially to why I went in mathematics rather than uh, physics because I, I I was in quantum mechanics and all these uh, functions they were uh, integrated. They said, well, well, it's it's zero because it's 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 an odd function, but it goes to infinity and not to infinity, and, and, and so <laughs> it's it's really non integral. My my head was exploding over the tricks that were used. Obviously, the mathematics held up if you did it. He, he was he was trying to save us some steps, right. but uh, yeah, I mean, uh, tricks tricks are accepted when they yeah. work. And yeah, it's that's not, true. Yeah, yeah. Feynman, works. who plays a huge role in the book too, as uh, sort of a foil for Gelman and a foil for when Hawking interacted. Although Hawking had great respect for Feynman, uh, I don't know if the converse was necessarily exactly true. Um, but uh, but yes, this 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 no this wick rotation, this tricky wicket, sick, sticky tricky wicket. Um, I don't know how to say it, but but the point is, you do this wick rotation, and then you transform uh, the time dimension effectively into a space dimension, which allows you to overlay a metric on it, and then you're able to do uh, Feynman path integration, which only works uh, in Euclidean signature metrics or in Minkowski space, if you like. Um, and so you're absolutely right. Um, and so none of my physicist colleagues uh, apply this. I don't know a single physicist who applies, you know, wick rotations and, and the Hawking hard on no boundary, um, uh, you know, conjecture as anything other than, you know, a curiosity that led to the fame of Stephen Hawking in some sense, if they know it at all. And in fact, I didn't read, I didn't finish a brief history of time. I started when I was 18 and I didn't finish it until two years ago <laughs> um, because I felt like, you know, he was such a towering figure. And, and I know... Um, one, one thing about the book, I feel like it's very well written. I feel like even though you make this patch writing and, and readers should read what, what that means. And, and Charles, you're, you're, uh, the, really the best person in the world, I think who can comprehend, you know, not at the full level of a theoretical physicist, although that's not me either. 
I'm a, I'm a simple experimentalist, uh, but uh, but at the level of a journalist looking at like, well, is this plagiarism? Can you pl- plagiarize yourself? All these things I found incredibly interesting, um, but I leave that to the to the readers to to enjoy on their own. Uh, but from a from a uh, just from a lay audience reading perspective, now putting taking off my professional physicist hat. He is a delightful writer, and it's impossible not to de- uh, detach his mischievous, mercurial nature. Um, but of course, people didn't know the real him. And in fact, I brought this up uh, with Paul Steinhardt, who's another character who figures heavily in this book. Paul's a mentor and a friend of mine, two-time guest on the Into the Impossible podcast. And I actually never knew about their uh, their embattled feud. And actually, this earlier this year, Paul and I were talking. I had given a talk at the Simons Foundation, and Paul and I had been talking about, well, what is the state of, of affairs in, you know, in kind of the multiverse, uh, you know, perspective, which, 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 uh, Paul is vehemently against. And, uh, and I said, well, here's what Hawking said in verse edition three, you know, he talked about the Hawking Hartle theorem. He talked about the no boundary and that's more than ever. People are becoming to see that it's, you know, it's to be taken seriously. This is in 2016. So after bicep two, uh, the inflation, you know, claim was retracted, et cetera. Um, and he says, uh, and then in the grand design, which he references obliquely in the second or third edition of Brief History of Time that I read, uh, he says that that's taken even more seriously than ever. Now, that's step two in his evisceration of God. Let's talk about that. The grand design. What was the purpose there? It was to, in my mind, invalidate the need for a God to instantiate the laws of physics. Um, what is the perspective that you bring or that you discovered in the writing of this book? How seriously is that approach taken, the invocation of M-theory to accomplish these uh, very, very lofty goals of of instantiating the laws of physics itself? Yeah. Um, Hawking's own interest in M-theory was really not deep. Um, that he um, got into it late um, and was more or less dragged kicking and screaming into it because of some results which were butting up against what he was doing. Um, really, that's when he truly engaged with it. Um, he, at the time he was writing Brief History of Time, and we're, we're talking mid-80s, um, he was an N equals 8 supergravity person. And he, he was always a gravitational physicist. He, he was not... Um, He had picked up uh, field theories and such. I mean, during his time at Caltech, he was immersed in in that uh, um, uh, sort of area, but he was still a gravitational physicist at heart. And I think uh, until um, the the, uh, the, 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 the Witten... um, uh, Work he 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 got in, he really got an interested when when n equals eleven supergravity really gave you this insight into all of string theory m theory um, so and then he, he basically tasked his graduate students to learn it for him and bring him up to speed um, he used it himself to kind of shore up some of the problems which the no boundary uh, uh, theorem was was showing the 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 um, the fact that he had to kind of bring in the anthropic principle and uh, reject the uh, the idea of uh, a compact universe and the idea of multiversism really appealed to him because he could really I think he reenvisioned the no boundary. His, his, his gestalt in in the language of M theory, but I don't I, I never got the sense that it was fundamental to his thinking about it. And honestly, if you look at the grand design, it is not that dissimilar from a brief, brief yeah. history of time, just updated a little bit with a vocabulary t- changed to a more modern version. At least that's that's my take on it. Um, maybe 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 uh, Dr. Mladena would 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 argue that there's something more deep to it. And, I, I, and, and certainly he, he, he um, has the perspective of 20 years of fighting over this and his, his uh, attacks on philosophy, which again, got him in deep trouble in the press, uh, reflect that. But 
honestly, I don't, I don't think the fundamental nature of his arguments were changed. Yeah. Much. Um, it just, it just took on a slightly different cast. I look at him, you know, the, uh, I don't know how familiar you are, you are with biblical Hebrew, uh, but the, uh, the word Israel in Hebrew, the word itself means one who fights with God. In other words, you're wrestling mm -hmm. with God, you're saturated with it because Jacob, the legend goes, you know, wrestled with an angel. And then his name was changed from Yaakov, Jacob to Israel, Israel. And that means because he fought and wrestled and prevailed with God, meaning that um, one should struggle with God. It's almost a definition. So I made a joke to Leonard Mladenow, who is, you know, at least culturally, biologically Jewish, if not uh, a theist himself. I made a joke that, you know, I believe that that Stephen was was deeply Jewish. Uh, because he struggled so much with God, and it's really saturated, and his writing uh, is is replete with God. And I wonder if you can give a perspective on that. Uh, although at different times in in both your book and and um, and Leonard's most recent book, there really is a, a, an impression that I get that you know he would pay lip service to God. I mean, it was rumored that he said. Uh, you know, the, uh, you know, every, equ every equation in your book reduces the readership by half. Every mention of God doubles the number of sales that you make. And we all must hustle our books. And, and it's still his book, Brief History of Time, remains a bestseller. And, and it's really unparalleled in popularity. Um, and yet the end of the book ends with this invocation of the deity and saying things. If we come up with a theory of everything, which he ultimately did not do, although he was never close. He was never even working in that field that would unify all these laws together. And we'll get to that. Um, but the end of the book is if we can get to a theory of everything, then we will truly know the mind of God. And actually, that does double duty because uh, just last week I interviewed Michio Kaku and his book, The God Equation. So, you know, Charles, if, if, if mentioning God one, you know, once in your book doubles the sales, what about, you know, the title of the book? If it has God in it, come on. That's got to yeah, and there's, there's a God particle. Uh, yeah, so so if, if if you can, as a physicist, link your idea to to a deity, uh, I'm not sure whether Zoroaster would work, but uh, yeah, I think I think it does help. And I, 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 one of the things I wanted to find out is actually whether he himself penned that last yes. line. And I was not able to get to ah, the that was my question. Uh, yes, did he do that or did his editor? So some people say in the YouTube comments below uh, that you'll see on, on previous comments, and I'm sure on this video as well. My audience is the most astute in all the multiverse, if I believed in such things. Uh, but uh, but yes, they they say that no, he was forced to by his editor and Bantam, you know, kind of did. And there were various times that even Leonard, uh, you know, makes the case that yeah, he would change things here and there. Um, but more than that, I think testifying to his ultimate, um, you know, kind of prominence is that not only did he invoke the name of God, but other physicists would invoke the name of Hawking. Most recently, a guest on the show, Leonard Susskind, who not only mm -hmm. like Leonard Malad now, these, these, uh, you know, theoretical, you know, particle physicists love to cite Stephen Hawking in the title of their books. So, so Leonard had, of course, written many books. Leonard, uh, Malad now wrote several, co-wrote some of the books with, uh, Stephen Hawking in his later years. Some say he played a role in 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 the brief history of time. Is there any truth to that? I don't believe. Yeah, I don't think was. so either. But uh, but uh, and then Leonard Susskind invokes the name of Hawking. Now I want to turn to this um, to the statement that everything it said about that we know about Stephen Hawking is wrong. Uh, in his lifetime, I'm reading from uh, from the publicity for this book, this wonderful book, Hawking Hawking, available now from Basic Books, talking to the author who I feel is a kindred spirit, and I salute his courage. Hawking was widely seen as a genius on par with Newton, but in reality, he was by no means the greatest physicist of his day. His early work on black holes was groundbreaking, but Charles Seif, professor at MIU, today's guest, argues much of his later work failed to measure up to its promise, and physicists like Roger Penrose ultimately deserve more credit than Hawking. Walk us through that. Was he, at any point in time, was he anywhere near the stature of an of a Newton, an Einstein whose birthday he shares his death day with, and uh, other characters in the history of physics? Yeah, I mean, saying you're no Newton... Uh, is not really an insult to physicists. I mean, there aren't very many people who could stand up to Newton, uh, who created an entire field and a mathematical framework to do it. And to a lesser extent, although almost equally significant, Einstein, uh, who also was struggling with cre creating a mathematical framework uh, underneath it all, and also fundamental um, 
contributions to both relativity and quantum mechanics at the same time, and really a, a, a liminal figure. Uh, so, so saying that Hawking is no Newton or Einstein's, that, that is kind of like a well, duh. Uh, but for the fact that his fame to a large extent rested on that comparison, that he, mm. uh, while at the same time he would hold it at arm's length and he was very explicit, I am no Newton, I am no Einstein, I'm not Galileo, at this, he would always bring up in a sideways way these comparisons. His biographies, which he approved in his, uh, would compare him to Einstein and Newton. He held the Lucasian chair, so he had the uh, intellectual uh, kind of uh, the imprimatur of the, the same people who gave it to uh, Newton. Uh, and his, I mean, he always used to say his birthday was on the same day as Galileo 300 years earlier. And I, he doesn't believe in metempsychosis. I mean, he, he doesn't, <laughs> but, but that sort of stuff. I mean, it goes back to, uh, uh, what was it, uh, Pythagoras, mm -hmm. who, who claimed he was uh, the, the reincarnation of a Trojan hero. I mean, the, the, the idea of this this kindred spirit goes back. So, so he, while pushing it away, he was very clever at claiming it. And, and his, I mean, his gravestone, and one, another question which I was trying to get, uh, did he design his gravestone right. or not? Or did he describe the motto? Because it, it is in English exactly the same uh, as what is on uh, Newton's grave just a few yards away. Yeah. Uh, here lies what was is mortal of Stephen Hawking. Or Isaac Newton in Latin. Um, so yeah, so that's that's not much of an insult. Um, one of the biggest insults that I mean, I think probably one of the things that in reading reviews of his his books that probably hurt him the most was a colleague of his, someone who is kind of an academic sibling, had the same PhD advisor, uh, John Barrow, um, basically savaged him. Um, after his uh, Hawking's big uh, discoveries of Hawking radiation and all that, and said that none of it would survive, that it was not going to be looked at in uh, future generations. And there's some truth to that partially. I mean, he was living in a quasi-classical, uh, a semi-classical realm, which he knew at the very beginning was wrong on some fundamental level. Uh, and I, I mean, he knew that Hawking radiation was real in the same way. I mean, but he, he knew that he was working with a theory that was going to, I mean, the, his, his mathematical framework was not complete in a way that would give him lasting uh, fame like, like Newton or Einstein. There was not that mathematical breakthrough. And I also would argue that um, a lot of the, I mean, Hawking got a lot of the glory, but... Uh, the person who, I mean, really started the chain reaction that led to Hawking radiation uh, ultimately goes back to Penrose. Mm. Um, and you, he had a mathematical insight. I mean, maybe this is the mathematician in me, but kind of understanding the application of some novel mechanism to get this great insight. And, and Penrose's insight was the singularity uh, uh, that a black hole collapsing must have a singularity. And he did it using topological arguments that hadn't been used before. And it opened up this whole field. And Hawking, to his credit, and it, this was not trivial. I mean, it was really interesting yeah. to apply that to the birth of the universe. And um, for and he did it the, the way everyone talks about it, is he, he realized that reversing time was uh, if you if you see a black hole collapse in reverse, it's a big bang. But there's some mathematical issues that need to be sorted out to make those equivalent. And, and Penrose was saying his real insight was not this time reversal, but making that mathematical structure work so that he could show that it applied as well. Mm -hmm. And so, I, I mean, I think that was a real insight, and it was it, it was important. Um, but by its nature, it was overshadowed by the father of that field. So um, one has to kind of look at his achievements. It's not in a, in a vacuum. It's not like he's this lone genius who appears and voila, there's this novel 
uh, idea out mm -hmm. there, which, I mean, Newton, you have an argument that there is some, Einstein even less so. I mean, I, th I think if Einstein weren't born, uh, I mean, Juan Carré was going around the edges. Would it have appeared 10 years later? Probably. Yeah. Hilbert, um, Hilbert, right. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Uh, and similarly, like, like if, you t if you took out Hawking, if Hawking disappeared, how would physics be different today? And that's a really good question. I'm not sure it would be that much different because, I mean, you have UNRWA radiation. Um, Davies and UNRWA were there like three or four years later. And that's really equivalent uh, in some and way. And Beckenstein, as you point so, out, was there two years before him, right? Or five years before, you know, yeah. many years before, him, right? Yeah. Uh, the, the, the fundamental idea was Beckenstein's. But, but to be fair, Beckenstein couldn't bring it to completion. He just couldn't finish that up. Mm -hmm. But yeah, I guess uh, the question was, is, was really yeah, I mean, for somebody like, uh, like a Hawking, how, you know, I mean, how, how reasonable is this? So one, one thing I have, and maybe we'll switch to this, although, I, um, yeah, let, let's just go there now. And then I want to ask you, um, if you, uh, put on your journalist hat and you're in a press conference or you're in a private interview and Steven has to answer any one question, uh, I'm going to let you pose that question in a minute, but before we do, I want to just take a break, remind people you're talking, you're listening to a conversation that I'm enjoying so much with, uh, with, with really a kindred spirit, Professor Charles Seif of New York University, who's a mathematician, you know, at, at, at the beginning of his career and now is a journalist or so a journalism professor at uh, one of the best universities in the world. And I want to talk to him a little bit about that if we'll have time. Uh, but, but before we do that, I want to just uh, ask you, remind you, if you're enjoying this, please do give a thumbs up and subscribe if you would. It helps us all out. And please check out uh, Charles's book. I'm going to have a link uh, to purchase it. And I get uh, one micro cent for every purchase. If you use this Amazon link that I'm going to provide. Uh, <laughs> and that's Hawking Hawking by Charles Seif. Charles written eight books, nine books, zero. Uh, you've written uh, many other books that I'll have links to as well. Uh, but Charles, now looking at these, uh, you know, kind of theories. And when I, when I uh, look at things like M theory, and I look at Hawking's contribution, and we look at the question, you know, is inevitable, should he have won the Nobel Prize if he was alive or when he was alive? Um, Hawking radiation, his signature contribution uh, is, and at least in the cases where he believed it was already maybe evident in the production of gamma ray bursts and stuff, which was later ruled out at the cent as responsible for the neutrino deficit in the uh, solar neutrino problem, which was later disproven. Um, so almost all of his physical connections were disproven. Hawking radiation you know, in, in our universe on average would take of order a hundred billion years perhaps to observe. Um, and yet, and yet he would routinely lose bets, uh, to fellow physicists, including to, uh, Kip Thorne and, uh, Lenny Susskind, who was a guest on the show, whose book mentions him directly, how my battle with Stephen Hawking made the world safe for quantum mechanics. Uh, so he's in the title of the book, not only God is mentioned, but, but you know, Stephen Hawking, um, a very, by a very serious physicist. Why did he concede these bets? Uh, you know, n none of the work done, uh, has any validity or any provability. In fact, the disproof of the destruction of entropy, which I believe or information, which correct me if I'm wrong. And that was Hawking's position, uh, that the entropy or information could be destroyed in a black hole and, uh, Preskill and Thorne and others bet him that it couldn't be. And he lost that bet like he did every single other bet. Uh, but um, why did he concede? The proof came from Juan Maldacena using, you know, holographic principle, ADS, CFT, you know, five dimensional, you know, cosmology, which also don't exist. So, or proof from string theory from Ed Witten, which we have no evidence for. Why would you, why would he concede? Was it part of his publicity stunt campaign? Uh, to put it bluntly, I think he wanted to piss on that tree <laughs> uh, because everyone else had, Kind of done so. He, he was in the minority. Uh, I mean, there are general rel relativists who still hold that position, uh, but it really does. Uh, it was even at the time a minority opinion, probably that that um, information was destroyed. Um, and I think he came to believe that the weight of evidence was against him, and that rather than kind of looking like um, hold, holding to the end as the ship is sinking, he wanted to uh, take a lead in reclaiming his paradox, even through his concession, which um, 
was baffling to a lot of people because uh, I, I was actually at Dublin when he made the announcement. Oh, wow. And uh, people didn't understand what he was doing, not least of what reason, but was there weren't enough details to really figure it out. Again, it used um, the Euclidean, uh, the uh, Wick rotated uh, formalism, which most people didn't use, weren't familiar with. He didn't give enough detail, even if he were familiar with that, to, to explain his reasoning precisely. So it was kind of a thumbnail sketch. Um, and it really didn't convince anyone but himself. And it was kind of an interesting anecdote uh, that I got from the graduate student who was announcing for him that even the graduate mm. student didn't believe <laughs> Hawking's uh, uh, proof at that point. It, was, it wasn't uh, convincing to him. So, yeah, it was. I, I think it, it that that concession in particular was really to keep his position at the forefront. Mm. Of, thought leadership yeah, yeah and, and, and this paradox which is kind of central and it's kind of it's gotten this renaissance recently which is just brilliant um but he he, he wants to still be there and uh if it meant kind of reversing himself i, I mean i think i think he realized that he had to do it and it, but if, if if he was going to do it he wanted to do it his mm. way yeah, and he would, you know, he would say things, of course, and do things that Roger Penrose said in one of my interviews with him uh, that I'll link to somewhere in the notes or above. Uh, you know, he said, no matter, it was great to bet Stephen Hawking because no matter which side you took, you'd always win. In other words, he he not only you know made but bets, you know, almost as if to lose them, but he would switch sides midstream. Uh, he would concede things, and I remember seeing the bet with with um, with Kip Thorne. Uh, you know, at Caltech when I was at Caltech in the, in the Westbridge building. And, uh, but, you know, but I always felt about him, you know, he was known for these very provocative things about, you know, God not being necessary, you know, God being a, a delusion, a fairy tale to let people sleep at night. And in doing so, God had great value only in doing so. Uh, he also said this, this is one of the most quoted uh, of his quotes that at least in humanist circles, he said, the human race is just a chemical scum on a moderate sized planet orbiting around a very average star in the outer suburbs of one among a hundred billion galaxies. We are so insignificant that I can't believe the whole universe exists for our benefit. That would be like saying that you would disappear if I closed my eyes. <laughs> this is like, you know, very awe inspiring, very hopeful, uh, <laughs> you know, kind of fair from him. I'm going to ask you if you were, uh, uh to, to get to have an interview with him. It was a, it was a, you know, Barbara Walters, you know, uh, style. Now it's Charles Seif style. Uh, what would you ask him? He asked to answer it truthfully. What question would the journalist in you ask him? Oh, uh, uh, if he has to answer truthfully, it's different than what I would ask him. Under All right, I'll give you both. I'll give you both. You so, can do both. Yeah. So, yeah. Um, so, uh, in ordinary circumstances, for, for me, I think I would press him on falsification of his mm -hmm. ideas. And at what point would he have to abandon the no boundary proposal? Mm -hmm. And um, given how it's kind of moved in different directions and some of his kind of subsidiary particle physics predictions like the uh, non-observability of the Higgs boson fell apart. Okay, at what point do you realize that you're barking up the wrong tree and have to make a major revision of your mm -hmm. thought? So that that's that's kind of what I would I would do if I didn't have the golden lasso. <laughs> uh, let's see if 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 he had if he were bound to answer truthfully. I think I would ask him what the degree to which um, he really he regrets his uh, fame and what it's done. What what does he regret about coming to fame? Because I I'm really interested in the interface at that moment when he rose to fame and at the same time he, he became estranged from, he, uh, he divorced his wife, uh, kind of became estranged and then wound up divorcing his wife. And in fact, his, his children as well in the 
years afterwards. And it was only, there was a, at least a decade, a little more than a decade, where he had strained relations uh, with, with uh, at least some of his children. And I want to know more about that turmoil uh, and to what extent he thinks he's responsible and could have done differently and to what extent it was kind of just a circumstance because because there's certain elements of his personality which kind of led to tragedy and certain elements which are just simply tragic um I, I'm very interested in the balance of that. Yeah, I mean, uh, that's certainly true. I had Neil deGrasse Tyson on uh, a couple weeks ago. And, you know, he was, I was asking about the impact. I was basically saying, you're, you know, you're the most famous living scientist, you know, at least by, you know, Twitter accounting, <laughs> if not by H index. And, you know, and he said, yeah. yeah. The Kardashian, What's guess. that? Is a, how, how's his Kardashian index? You know I'm that sure one? It's, it's it's higher than his uh, than his Erdos number, uh, but the uh, the the claim that he made was that yeah he can't even during COVID he can't even take the subway in your fair city of New York uh, with uh, with a mask on uh, because he's so famous people will recognize him and God forbid he decides to speak you know his voice is so iconic and and I really I asked him you know would you trade it all. Uh, as the story in 1980, and sorry, in Animal Farm by George Orwell, the pig says uh, to the donkey, Benjamin, you've got this long, lovely tail. And Benjamin, the donkey says, yeah, the God gave me uh, this long tail to swat away the flies, but I'd rather not have the flies and not need the tail. And I asked him, how do you resonate with that? And he basically said, yeah, I, I just want to go down to, you know, take a boat to to the Bahamas and uh, and just write books all day long. And, uh, you know, I, a little tear came down my, my, my chin, but you know, I'm, I'm not going to weep too much. Maybe your next book will be a, a takedown of Neil deGrasse Tyson. That, that would be an interesting book. Uh, I wonder if that could get uh, published, <laughs> uh, but no, no, Neil's a good friend uh, of the show. And, and, uh, and, and we had a great conversation. I'll put a link to the talk with him up here. Uh, also, I asked the same of Michio Kaku and this turns us to our next uh, discussion topic, which is about, which is just about fame. And so you know, most physicists that are good, um, you know, they kind of, uh, they earn in private and then, you know, to some extent they, they spend in public, you know, if they give a lecture, you know, day to day, like, like a Roger Penrose, he will do a lot of work over decades. Uh, and then he will, uh, and then he'll, you know, give some lectures and he'll try to, you know, maybe convince people of this conformal cyclic cosmology, which most cosmologists don't take very seriously. Um, but in the meantime, he's done tremendous contributions to everything from, you know, crystal structure, tiling, math, pure math, black holes, singularities, cosmology. Uh, it's just that his, you know, current model is not so, uh, P uh, Stephen seems almost the opposite or, or maybe, you know, delayed, uh, in that he, you know, he had this one spectacular contribution and then, uh, but basically all of his earning, you know, was in, was in, uh, all of his spending and earning was in public. Uh, in, in other words, he, he didn't really, there weren't, if you look at his H index, it's, it's very low. You know, he has a couple papers that are cited thousands and thousands of times, but his books are read millions of times. And I wonder, you know, what do you make of this? That there are people like, um, like, uh, Hawking, like, uh, you know, Brian Green nowadays, uh, Crosstown rival at NYU, uh, from NYU at Columbia, um, and, and other Lisa Randall, et, et cetera, uh, uh, Machio Kaku, hopefully someday Brian Keating. No, uh, the, but, but the point being, you know, what do you make of this, you know, scientific scientist celebrity? I mean, no, the, even Hawking didn't really fully compare relative to his time, no pun intended as Einstein did, you know, when I, the day Einstein died, time magazine printed a special cover and it said a picture of the planet with a sign pointing Einstein lived here. But, you know, Einstein, you know, also did a lot of great work, turned 40, you know, ish and, and stopped really contributing. But but um, the fact that that Hawking's singular contribution cannot be f falsified or verified in our time, unlike Penrose, perhaps, um, you know, what do you make of this? That these phys you know, physicists come uh, come, you know, raconteurs and and, and popularizers. Uh, is that is that a sign of decline, you know, in their physical pro physics prowess or is that something that's healthy for for society, if not for their own personal H indices, as we say? Yeah, good question. Um, well, first, I don't, I don't want to understate Hawking's contribution. I mean, he was definitely a physicist of the first rank. So I, I don't want to kind of make it look like he's got a uh, he, he, he's a pretender in that sense. Uh, 
However, I mean, you're absolutely right that there was kind of a disproportionate uh, uh, fame that accrued because of the popularization. Um, you know, I, I, I'm all in favor of scientists going popular. I think I think our society needs more of that, and I, I, not just kind of the the science of the first rank, like I mean, uh, uh, George Gamow in generations previous. I mean, uh, lots of people grew up with with his yeah. books. Um, uh, just again, a brilliant physicist. Um, and had he become a superstar, I think our society would have been the better for it. So I don't, I mean, I think Hawking's voice was, was a good voice to have. I think part of the reason it seems like it fits so poorly in some ways is because there's so few others out there who you would think, given equivalent um, achievements, would at least be a little bit more prominent. They may not be as prominent as that, but uh, people kind of bubbling around. Really, kind of the, the famous scientists of our day. It's it's to the public. It's it, it is. I mean, Neil deGrasse Tyson, Bill Nye, who's uh, really an engineer yeah. and uh, hasn't hasn't done uh, his career isn't doing science. Um, and uh, I mean. Uh, Brian Greene has some as well, but I mean, I, I, I'm not sure that Brian Greene gets recognized on the street in the way that Neil deGrasse Tyson does, and certainly not the way Hawking does. Right. So um, I, th I think Hawking's fame looks bizarre just because there aren't, I mean, that, that's, it, it's so rare, and he was so far above everyone else. Mm. Uh, and, I mean, he, he needed it too. I mean, it's, it, I mean he because of his disease, had these huge expenses and his fame and his royalties allowed him to live outside of a communal setting. I mean, it's, it's, it's a testament to his first wife. It's a testament to his friends who got charities uh, holding it together for him. And, and then his, his royalties kept him functioning and uh, contributing not just to physics. I mean, I mean, even even after he himself was not doing um, uh, physics on his own, real great physics, he was a PhD advisor who was uh, getting some of the best students out there, who, many of whom found him inspirational. Yeah. Um, so he he was important to society. I just again, I just I just wish it weren't, weren't so anomalous mm -hmm. that there are there are people who would should have equal fame and are equally articulate and have great contributions and can write and uh, can lecture and uh, they don't get the same uh, element. But it, life isn't fair, as, as Hawking is the first right. to tell you. Uh, so I want to close just by talking first about the halo effect in that just like Einstein, you know, he was really held in high regard in regimes far outside of his discipline of expertise, you know, in the same way that Einstein was asked to be the second prime minister of Israel, you know, this is a man who uh, abhorred nationalism, so, you know, uh, so, but because he was so bright and the two men share another fatal flaw, at least in my opinion, uh, in their characters, which is that they were kind of uh, terrible fathers in many cases. I mean, Einstein basically abandoned one of his kids who uh, to a uh, uh, what they called a, a sanatorium, a mental institution, what we might call, um, you know, today. Uh, and, uh, and of course, Hawking had this relationship even with his kids and his wife, his first wife, Jane, uh, that uh, was really, you know, almost like completely dis disinterested and, and, and dis disconnected. You talk about their first trip as young, you know, postdocs maybe to Cornell and, and he's just like listening to Wagner and, you know, blasting the volume and the kid is, you know, almost dying, you know, cho almost choking to death at another point. And, and she has to take care of him instead of, instead of, uh, her child, her two-year-old or one-year-old, whatever Robert was at the time. Um, and so, you know, both these men had these huge flaws. I wonder, you know, is it true that just raw intellectual horsepower supersedes the aspects of one's character? I remember thinking, you know, I've said this before, you know, because I am a practicing Jew, if not like a complete theistic adherent, 
I still practice my, you know, I remember thinking, you know, and saying at different interviews I've given, you know, that I don't believe that the Torah, the Old Testament, the Bible, whatever is a science book any more than I believe a brief history of time is a manual of wisdom and ethics and how to raise my kids. So why, why do we care so much about, you know, the life advice or the ethical teachings of people that had really tortured, you know, at best, uh, you know, relate personal relationships? Yeah, I, uh, Hawking, Hawking's background, I mean, his, his relationship with his family was complicated. Because of his situation, I mean, it's, it's, he was unable to rough and tumble with his kids and be a father in the same way that other fathers could be, just because, I mean, it, it's not a total explanation, but it does, uh, his situation does limit him. And uh, when he was interviewed a number of years later, if he, someone asked what he regretted about his disease, it was that I wasn't there more for my children. So I don't think that it is a total disinterest as much as kind of the reality is getting in the way. Um, but yeah, I mean, it's, I, I, I think that, uh, I mean, he, he, he doesn't, if his intellect were all that he were, I don't think this public would have been very interested, honestly. Mm. Um, I think that there was more to him and, even even disease aside, I mean, he was witty. He was, and as you mentioned, I mean, it shows in his way of of talking to others, his way of writing, um, the self deprecating humor, the stoicism. The um, I mean, he's he, he's quite a character. He's he's um, he can leave people laughing. His lectures were would have people rolling, uh, and I I asked. A number of them, because because so much of time uh, of humor is timing, and he can't time yeah. things. How does he? How is he so funny? And they couldn't explain it, but it, it was just his his personality worked, and it, it 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 was it was something warm about him too. Um, so I, I I think he succeeded in a way that say an Edward Teller or a Johnny von Neumann would never kind of become. Um, I think just out of their pure intellect, uh, but yeah, no, he is he, not someone to look to for moral advice. Uh, <laughs> is it? Is then it again, which of us are? There aren't very many of us I, I'd listen to, much less right. myself. Uh, is it true that you know his second wife Elaine? Uh, she was a nurse, right? Uh, one of his carers, as he would call them, uh, and then her husband was really the the driving force be behind Stephen's, you know, uh, second voice synthesizer. Is that, is that true? Yeah. He, he engineered it so it would fit on his wheelchair, uh, that it was engineered by someone in the States and, uh, David Mason, Elaine Mason's husband, uh, engineered it. And, and, um, he wound up servicing it long after his wife, uh, left. Yeah, with I, I found Stephen. that so bizarre. Uh, you know, basically uh -huh. he had, he enabled the technology that Stephen seduced his, <laughs> his wife away from. Yeah. Uh, and I, so I, he he just wouldn't talk. I I, I actually went to Cambridge uh, and knocked on his door, uh -huh. hoping that he would answer, and he he actually did. Uh -huh. And he gave me this look when I told him you know I was talking, and he just. The, the the kind of the sorrow and uh, I, I I just can't talk about wow. it. I'm sorry, and that was it. Well, uh, Charles, we've come to the end of our conversation. I've really thoroughly enjoyed it. Now I have to go and teach. I, I want to give you just a chance to say a little bit about uh, your teaching and your role at NYU. It's a, one of the world's foremost uh, institutions. Um, how, how, um, what is your area of specialty? And, and then uh, what could students expect if they uh, are lucky enough to get accepted and matriculate there in that fine university? Yeah, uh, so NYU has a really nice journalism department, which is both undergraduate and graduate. With the graduate side, we have a science, uh, health, and environmental reporting program we call SHERP, and I'm attached to that. And I teach science journalists how to do investigative reporting. And so kind of uh, getting your green eye shade on and getting into books and, and having a very skeptical sometimes view of science um, uh, as opposed to the gee whiz science, which we all enjoy writing about, but there's more to journalism than that. And undergraduates, I teach uh, writing generally. I, I, one of my favorite courses right now is I teach programming for journalists oh, nice. uh, using Python. 
and we I teach them how to do web scraping and hooking up to APIs and doing data analysis, uh, which is uh, a lot of fun. And, and by the end of the semester, they're actually pretty good. <laughs> yeah. So journalists can learn to code. Wow, I, I thought we weren't allowed to say that. <laughs> yeah, absolutely. It's it it it. it and uh, what what we're not allowed to say is that it, it can help you supplement your income. <laughs> <laughs> uh, just the last question, just because you brought it up, you know, science and and science journalism. Um, I am vehemently opposed to press conferences uh, in science as a modality of disseminating information that makes it into like a sporting event or a prize match. Um, literally, sometimes you know, gunning to to uh, you know be first in line to to win one of these uh, Nobel Prize medallions, uh, which I happen to have from my nine guests that have left different things in my couch over there. Uh, but uh, but what, what's your opinion about press conferences? Are they net good? I mean, first of all, they're relatively modern phenomenon. Is that not right? Relatively, um, that. There is kind of this engineering of the science press. It goes, the journals um, have these press releases and for big things, they have press conferences. And the press conference after peer review has gone back decades. The press conference before peer review is a much more recent thing. <laughs> uh, the um, a cold fusion fiasco was one where it really kind of the uh, Pons and Fleischmann held a press conference so that they could uh, gazumph uh, Jones, uh, who was sniffing at the, at the same uh, direction. Yeah. So that sort of thing is is pretty recent, and I, I think that sort of stuff is it 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 is problematic to say the least. And I I, I put the kind of the engineering generally. Uh, as problematic because what it's doing is it's presenting a prepackaged narrative rather than and and journalists like all creatures are kind of do the path of least uh, least resistance least action uh, and will take that narrative instead of teasing it apart and as you know I mean the bicep tooth thing is a is a great example of that there was a kind of a, an embargoed press package that turned out to be giving a very misleading impression of what was there. And had people been going outside of the narrative, it's more likely that they would have picked up some uh, signals that go against uh, that narrative. That's right. Yeah. Yeah. I'm all, uh, I'm all for transparency. Uh, but, you know, my, my goal is, and if I could ask you to do one thing with your colleagues in science journalism, is really convey to, to the scientific teams that whatever dollars they they reserve for publicity, that they have some fraction to hedge against the possibility of retraction. Because as you know, in the front page of your hometown newspaper, the New York Times was splashed these results. And then maybe on page B17 of the Saturday edition, which I believe is the least read of all the weekly edition uh, you know, um, editions of an, of any given newspaper, then on B17 on Saturday, you'll see, oh, bicep team or whoever retracts, you know, claim that was above the fold, literally, uh, you know, just, you know, six months ago. And so the public is left. I still get from scientists. Oh, wow. You were involved with bicep. You know, that's so amazing. You detected inflation. And, uh, and so I think that, you know, every, every dollar needs to have at least, you know, 10 cents, 25 cents in reserve, um, you know, to guard against the possibility that, you know, if if ninety nine percent of three sigma results <laughs> are, are wrong, you know, I mean, how much more so of you know two sigma and, and so forth. So anyway, that's my hobby horse. Uh, I I don't know if you agree. If you want to say respond to that uh, kind of provocation. Oh yeah, I, I definitely do. And uh, part of the problem is that what journalism often does, and what makes people interested in a story, is that it goes against what you expect and what is normal. And so big results are automatically abnormal. Uh, and of course, in science, things that are abnormal are more likely to be wrong, which sets up science journalism for failure before we even start. So there's a structural problem. I completely Amazing. agree. Uh, Charles Seif, professor at NYU journalism, author of Hawking Hawking, Selling of a Scientific Celebrity, Zero, the Biography of a Dangerous Idea, Alpha and Omega, The Search for the Beginning and End of the Universe, Decoding the Universe, Science of, Explain of Information, Sun in a Bottle, Proofiness, 
Uh, I believe maybe you're working on a book as we're talking. Maybe your hand was uh, hidden. At a, show your hands. Make sure that you're actually not typing another book. What's next? For you? Nothing. Nothing at the point. At What's next point. for you? I don't know. Um, right now, it's uh, the, this book was fairly exhausting. It was done during COVID and uh, doing that while my kids have tremendous needs was very difficult. So I think I think this summer is going to be kid time at the very least before I. I well, your, your kids and your students are very lucky, Charles. I mean that uh, sincerely. I feel, again, this connection. Um, you're a wonderful writer. Uh, I, w I envy your students to be able to learn from you, uh, especially Python. That would be really fun. Uh, I've, always, uh, I've always struggled with Python myself. I'm more of an IDL Fortran guy myself. But, but anyway, uh, Charles, you're, you're really a, a shining light, and no pun intended, in this field of science journalism. You're also, you bring a really uh, a special perspective that is unique. I want to thank you for this book, Hawking Hawking, and I want to invite you back. Whatever you do next, uh, I'm, I'm down for, and hopefully we'll meet in person someday when I'm back in my former hometown as well. Would love to see you.